Good morning. We're going to be reading from Joel, chapter 2, verses 12 through, I think it's 32. Yet now, even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning, and rend your hearts and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful and slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. And he relents over disaster. Who knows whether he will not turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him, a grain offering and a drink offering for the Lord your God? Blow the trumpet in Zion. Consecrate a fast. Call a solemn assembly. Gather the people. Consecrate the congregation. Assemble the elders. Gather the children, even nursing infants. Let the bridegroom leave his room and the bride her chamber. Between the vestibule and the altar, let the priest, the ministers of the Lord, weep and say, Spare your people, O Lord, and make not your heritage a reproach, a byword among the nations. Why should they say among their peoples, Where is their God? Then the Lord became jealous for his land, and he had pity on his people. And the Lord answered and said to his people, Behold, I am sending to you grain and wine and oil, and you will be satisfied, and I will no more make you a reproach among the nations. I will remove the northerner far from you and drive him into a parched and desolate land, and his vanguard into the eastern sea, and his rear guard into the western sea, the stench and the foul smell of him will rise, for he has done great things. Fear not, O land, be glad and rejoice, for the Lord has done great things. Fear not, you beast of the field, for the pastures of the wilderness are green, and the tree bears its fruit, and the fig tree and the vine give their full yield. Be glad, O children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given the early rain for your vindication. He has poured down for you abundant rain, the early and the latter rain as before. The threshing floors shall be full of grain, and the vats shall overflow with wine and oil. I will restore to you the years that the swarming locusts have eaten, the hopper, the destroyer, and the cutter, my great army, which I sent among you. And you shall eat in plenty and be satisfied. And praise the name of the Lord your God, who has dealt wondrously with you, and my people shall never again be put to shame. You shall know that I am in the midst of Israel and that I am the Lord your God and there is none else. And my people shall never again be put to shame. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons, your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams and your young men shall see visions. Even on the male and the female servants in those days, I will pour out my spirit. And I will show you wonders in the heavens and on the earth, blood and fire and columns of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, there shall be those who escape. As the Lord has said, and among the survivors shall be those whom the Lord calls. Amen. Thank you, Michelle. So when my brother graduated from high school, 
uh, he he took a summer and he served as a as a raft guide. Got hired by a raft company, taking uh, people down the Colorado River, the Green River, the Arkansas River, and they had customers from all over the world, all around the country. He had customers who were from uh, the country. He had customers that were from the city. Uh, and then he had customers that were really from the city who did not seem to understand some of the basics of earth science. So, for example, w- one time he and uh, some, some customers were carrying the raft down to the river. There was a, a steep bank. They had to carry the raft down. And then as they were putting the boat in the river, one of the customers said, boy, this is really going to be a bummer when we have to take it out up this hill at the end of the raft trip. As if that, that wasn't, you know, the, the, as if that wasn't bad enough, another customer literally said one time when they were on the river, are we like going in one big circle? Today we are kicking off a brand new series, a series called Who You Callin' Short. It's a series on the Minor Prophets. The Minor Prophets are a collection of books in the Old Testament uh, that are often overlooked. And they, uh, they, they are overlooked and overshadowed by the major prophets. The major prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, right? The major prophets, they're the ones that get all the press. They're the ones that get all the endorsement deals with Nike and Under Armour. And, and they get the Supermax contracts and all this. And then the, the minor prophets are overlooked and overshadowed. And why is this? Well, part of it is because they comprise the final 12 books of the Old Testament. So many of us, if we're reading through the Old Testament, we just don't make it that far. And then uh, another reason why they're overlooked is because they are comparatively very short. Sometimes only one or two pages long. I, as a man of fine stature myself, uh, have a special place in my heart for these minor prophets, and my burden throughout this series will be to demonstrate that these minor prophets pack a major punch. And we are beginning today with the prophet Joel. Now, uh, why I'm starting with Joel will become evident as we as we move forward. Uh, but Joel is a is a book where we don't really know a lot about Joel or the historical context uh, outside of we know that it was written sometime between the 8th century and the 6th century BC so this is the 700s to the 500s BC other than that we don't know now fortunately the the reason why we don't know is also the same reason why it doesn't really matter that we don't know with regards to its interpretation and that is that what what Joel talks about uh, what he describes are events that could could have taken place at any point um, in Israel's history and so actually knowing the time the date doesn't really affect the interpretation that much as we'll see now the the passage that I had Michelle read is really kind of right in the middle of of the book, and it really serves as the heart of the whole book. So we get this passage down, uh, we will have a good understanding of what Joel was all about. Now, there are a number of themes, of course, that emerge from this passage, but there is one central theme I want to begin with that, that, that Joel really drives home, and, and here's really what it is from a big picture, right? From a big picture perspective, what does Joel want us to see? And I believe what he would want us to see is this. God is a God who shows up. God is a God who shows up. In fact, this is a central theme of the prophets. If you want to just talk about the prophetic literature, whether it's the major prophets or the minor prophets, and, and try to really just get down to the, the basics of what they're trying to say, it's that God is a God who shows up. And so in this regard, what the prophets have to say stands in strong contrast to our, our sort of postmodern, post-existentialist era, okay, where there is sort of this attitude of, why would you wait and expect God to show up? He's never going to. Uh, I've mentioned before a play by Samuel Beckett called Waiting for Godot. Many people see it as the most significant English play ever written, and it, it's had a, a wide influence on culture and whatnot. And, and basically what the play is about is these two individuals who are simply waiting for somebody named Godot. And they just sit there and they wait 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 and they wait. 
and they wait. I mean, literally, this is the plate. They just wait and wait and wait for somebody named Godot to show up. And guess what? Godot never shows up. And of course, well, what is the meaning of this play? Well, there's a lot of different interpretations of it, but the, the most obvious one, based on the fact that the name is Gado, is that this is a way of saying, why is society waiting for God? God is never going to show up. And you see, the, the prophets stand in stark contrast to this. What the prophets want the people of Israel to see, and they want us to see ourselves today, is that God is a God who shows up. And this, this uh, main point emerges in both the writing prophets and the non-writing prophets. If you look at the, the office of the prophet in the, the scriptures, in the Old Testament scriptures, you find there's really two types of prophets, uh, uh, roughly speaking. There are the writing prophets and the non-writing prophets. See if you can guess what the difference is. Uh, yeah, right. So the, the difference is the non-writing prophets didn't write anything, right? Well, or at least we don't have record of them writing things. Rather, what we have with regards to the non-writing prophets is we have writings about them. And then, of course, we have the writing prophets who are the ones who wrote things. And so the non-writing prophets, they're the ones where you see in their lives God showing up. And the classic example of this, or probably the, the classic examples of the, of the non-writing prophets, uh, are... Elijah and his Padawan, Elisha. Elijah and Elisha. And what you find throughout their ministry is God showing up time and time again through them. Uh, perhaps the, the most quintessential example of this is this scene where uh, Elijah challenges the priests of Baal. The people of Israel were beginning to turn away from their God, from Yahweh, and they were beginning to worship uh, other gods, and Baal was one of the main ones. We're going to come to this increasingly as we move through the, the Minor Prophets. And what, what, uh, what Elisha wants them to see is, wait a minute, Baal does not show up. Why are you turning to Baal? He doesn't actually show up. Turn to Yahweh because he's actually the one that shows up. So he challenges the priests of Baal to kind of like a barbecue uh, cook-off, kind of what it is. And uh, they're like, let's see which God can, can do a better barbecue. And, and so it's, it's they, the first thing, he's like, Baal, you get to go first. Priests of Baal, you go first. And they set up this altar. And the idea is here, okay, okay priests of Baal, you can't press the little igniter button. No, you can't. You're not allowed to do that. You, Baal has to ignite the, 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 the grill. He has to set it on fire. And so what do they do? They sit there and they pray to Baal, and they pray, and they wait, and they wait, and they wait, and they wait, and they wait. Just like Vladimir and Estragon in Waiting for Godot, they wait, and they wait, and they wait. And guess what? The God of Baal never shows up. But then when it's Elisha's turn, he prays to Yahweh, and Yahweh shows up. You see, that story is really paradigmatic for all of the prophetic literature in this one central point. They want us to see that God is a God who shows up. Now, as we move into this passage in Joel, we can take this a step further. And what we discover is that God is at work, God shows up, God is at work in both the good and the bad, in the doom and in the deliverance. God shows up in both. So first of all, God is at work in the doom. God is at work in the doom and the gloom, in the hardship, uh, in the pain. Now, as I mentioned already, this uh, particular passage, this, the, the events that are described here and, and Joel's life itself, uh, himself, are, we, we don't really know uh, when they were written. And the reason why is because the events that are described here could have taken place at just about any time in Israelite history. Now, what exactly are the hardships that Joel describes in this passage. And what he describes is really two things. He describes a great famine that comes across the land, and he describes, even in greater detail, a great plague, a locust plague that comes uh, upon the people of Israel. So l let me just read here from the very beginning of Joel, Joel chapter 1, how it starts off. It says, The word of the Lord came to Joel, the son of Pethuel, Hear this, you elders, give ear all inhabitants of the land. Has such a thing happened in your days or in the days of your fathers? Tell your children of it and let your children tell their children and their children to another generation. What the cutting locust left, the swarming locust has eaten. What the swarming locust left, the hopping locust has eaten. What the hopping locust left, 
the destroying locust has eaten. Right now, to, to understand the gravity of what's going on here, we need to remember that uh, Israel, like most people in the ancient world, it, it, they were agriculture. It was an agricultural society. The, the, their economy was was fundamentally based on agriculture, and they were they were sort of like the trifecta of the of the different uh, the different crops, the different products. There was grain, wine, and oil. These were the big three. And so you had the grain, you had the, the wheat and the barley, uh, then you had the wine, so you had the, the vineyards, and then, of course, you had the oil, the olive groves. Right? So, so these were the, the, the three staples of their agricultural society. And what, what we see described in Joel is this, plo- this plague of locusts that sweeps through and devastates all of their agricultural crops just completely wipes it out. And, and we sort of get this picture of these locusts coming in waves, right? So like this wave of locusts comes and wipes out maybe a quarter of their crops. And you can sort of imagine the Israelites hiding in their homes and, and just watching this lo- locust plague come through, and, and, and they come through, and then the locust plague leaves, and they're like, Phew, and then they run out like, oh, okay, good. We still got three quarters of it. But it's like, oh, my gosh, look out. Another, another wave is coming. So that they run back into their homes, and they're hiding in their homes. And this other wave comes and, and, and attacks, and then it leaves. And then they run, okay, good. They're still half left. Oh, my goodness, another wave comes in. And this just keeps coming and keeps coming and keeps coming until it's all gone. One passage describes the, the bark of the olive trees, all of the bark just being completely ripped off. There's just nothing left. There's this imagery of, we're not talking about like, you know, a few, a few moths that maybe get into your church or get into your house. Right? We're talking about hundreds of thousands of, of locusts covering the ground, covering the sky. Look at the imagery that is described here uh, in chapter 2, verse 10. It says, the earth quakes before them, the heavens tremble, the sun and the moon are darkened, and the stars withdraw their shining. What he seems to be suggesting here is that the reason why the, the sun is darkened and the stars are darkened is because there is a cloud of locusts so massive that it's literally blocking out the sun and the stars like a cloud. And many scholars actually think that when it says that the earth quakes before them, this is a sort of metaphorical language but describing a very eerie scene, and that is that the ground was so completely covered by locusts that when they would kind of shimmy and move about, it would look as though the earth was quaking. I, I remember a number of years ago when we were living outside of Manhattan, uh, about, about, at about 4 o'clock, 4.30 on a Friday afternoon, so rush hour, um, a a huge uh, storm came through, an ice storm came through, and sheets of ice just came down on Manhattan and the surrounding area, and so everything was slick. Everywhere you went, it was slippery. I remember I had, I had friends who their commute from Manhattan was usually like 30 to 40 minutes, and it took them eight to nine hours to get home. It was one of those ones where you go out, and it's not like you just slip on a patch of ice and then you recover, but it's more like, have you ever had one of these falls where you have one of these falls that just like, you just keep falling? You know what I mean? Like you keep trying to recover, like you slip, uh, and then you go to recover, but then you slip again, and then you slip, and then you slip, and then you slip, and then you slip. I had one of these falls where I, I literally think I fell for about 45 seconds, and then finally when I, when I lost and the ice won, I was holding a guitar, um, a suitcase, and a backpack, and they all like flew in three different directions as I landed right on my back, right? Have you ever had this sort of experience where just literally everywhere you go, it's just slick and slippery covered with ice. With ice. That's what it was like on that, that day in Manhattan, okay? What I would suggest is that something similar is happening with the, the people of Israel, that when they would walk outside, they would slip. But they weren't slipping on ice. They were slipping on locusts. It was so completely covered. So this is the description that he gives. And he goes on and on and on. He, he actually describes this locust plague like an army. Listen to this in chapter 2, verses 4 through 9. Their appearance is like the appearance of horses, and like war horses they run. As with the rumbling of chariots, they leap on the tops of the mountains, like the crackling of flame of fire devouring the stubble, like a powerful army drawn up for battle. 
Before them, peoples are in anguish. All faces grow pale. Like warriors, they charge. Like soldiers, they scale the wall. They march, each on his way. They do not swerve from their paths. They do not jostle one another. Each marches in his path. They burst through the weapons and are not halted. They leap upon the city. They run upon the walls. They climb into the houses. They enter through the windows like a thief. What's described here is total devastation, economic devastation. Not just, ew, like we're kind of creeped out by it, right? No, this is total economic devastation at the hand of this locust plague. Now, What is most significant about this is this. What Joel wants them to see is that God is behind this terrible event. God, in some sense, has sent this plague upon the people. Notice this here in verse 11 of chapter 2. The Lord utters his voice before his army. For his camp is exceedingly great. He who executes his word is powerful, for the day of the Lord is great and very awesome. Who can endure it? You see, here in the book of Joel, and as we'll see throughout the prophets, we come up upon a very uncomfortable truth. And that is that, that while, yes, it's true that, that the good things, the blessings that come into our lives, that promotion that you get uh, at work, uh, when uh, that wonderful, sweet, beautiful lady says yes to you, uh, the, 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 the good things that you have, the health that you have, all of those are blessings, and they come from God. But what Joel wants us to see is that, guess what? The hardships do as well. Yes, uh, the blessings come from God. The, 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 the better comes from God, but so does the worse. The richer comes from God, but so does the poor. The health comes from God, but so does the sickness. You see, what the prophets get is that they understand that the nature of God, their understanding of who God demands this. You see, at the heart of the, the picture of the God of the Bible is a God who is sovereign over all things. He's the maker. He's the creator. He is the sustainer of all things. God is fully sovereign over all things. And so that means that he's sovereign over the good and he's sovereign over the bad. Now, we, we can, we can kind of sugarcoat this truth, which I think we do sometimes. And I think there's, there's good uh, biblical and theological reasons to sugarcoat it this way. So we can say things like this. God doesn't cause hardship. He allows it. Okay. And, and that's good. I, I get that. And I, I think that there's precedent to that. But, but what we need to realize is, 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 let's put it this way. Let's imagine that I am holding in my hand uh, a, a cup that is made of glass. And I'm just holding this cup made of glass. And then imagine that I let go. And the glass falls and it breaks. Okay, well, well you could say, did, did I cause it to break or did I, just, did I just let it break? I didn't break it, I just let go, right? I mean, it, there, there, there comes this point where it's like God is so sovereign that while we can say that, it's still kind of the same thing. God is so sovereign that even when he allows it, there's a sense in which we can say that he has caused it. Or to put it another way, he didn't have to allow it. He could have stopped it. And so there's this important sense. So this is where, see, the, the prophets, they're just bold about it, right? You can, you can word it however you like. The prophets like to just be in your face, bold it. God is behind this. They don't sugarcoat it. They just embrace it. However, what you find over and over and over and over again with the prophets, every single one of them without fail, they say this. Ultimately, God's action results in the deliverance of his people. 
Yes, he may be, for, for reasons we can't always get into, he may be behind the hardships and the trials, but ultimately, for his people, it always leads to deliverance. You see, throughout this series, we're going to be reading a lot about doom and gloom. The prophets, that might be another reason why people don't read them. There's a lot of doom and gloom in the prophets. Uh, I remember when I was living in Maryland, my grandpa lived with me uh, for several months. And uh, he, I, I would go off to work, and, and he would just stay at home. And he loved to listen to the radio. The problem was we could only get one radio station to come in. And so he just listened to it. It was this radio station that, that came out of, out of Baltimore. And, uh, and he called it the doom and gloom station. And I would come home from, from work, like, Grandpa, you know, how was your day? He's like, oh, three people got shot in downtown Baltimore. You know, a hurricane came through, wiped out an elementary school, and the mayor's having an affair with his secretary. Huh. The truth is, when you read the prophets, it kind of feel like that sometimes. It's just doom and gloom. But without fail... In every single one of the prophets, their ultimate goal is to show us, yes, God is behind the doom, but it always leads to deliverance for his people. So you see, the prophets want us to get and to understand the way we approach hardship and suffering, right, is that it's never simply a question of if God will see us through. It's only a question of when. As I like to say, the biblical understanding of the way we approach suffering and pain is it's not a philosophical question, it's an eschatological question. In other words, ultimately, it's never a question of why, it's a question of how long. How long, Lord, until you bring deliverance? And of course, what we find here in Joel is precisely this deliverance that comes. Chapter 2, beginning in verse 18. Then the Lord became jealous for his land and had pity on his people. The Lord answered and said to his people, Behold, I am sending to you grain, wine, and oil, and you will be satisfied. And I will no more make you a a reproach among the nations. I will remove the northerner far from you. And there it probably refers to the locust plague coming in from the north. I will drive him into a parched and desolate land, his vanguard into the eastern sea and his rear guard into the western sea. The stench and foul smell of him will rise, for he has done great things. And then again, farther on, you shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God, who has dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall never again be put to shame. You shall know that I am in the midst of Israel, and that I am the Lord your God, and there is none else. And my people shall never again be put to shame. So again, how does this apply to us today? It's really very simple. Here's the reality. No matter what you may go through in the next couple days, couple weeks, couple months, God will deliver you through it. Life, get this, life will get easier. Whatever you're dealing with, life will get easier even if you have to go through death to get there. It will get easier. Deliverance is on the way. There is not always one more hill to get over. We are not just going around in one big circle. How many of us feel that way sometimes? Like you're on a boat, you're in, you're in white water, and you're just going round and round and round and round, and there is no way out. Friends, the hope of the gospel, the hope of who the God is, as described throughout the Bible, is that, yes, there will be hardships, but God will see you through this. We are not like Clark Griswold in European Vacation, who gets stuck in a roundabout in the middle of London. And he just can't get over, can't get over into the turn lane and just keeps going round and round and round and round and round. We are not just waiting for Godot. God will come and God will will bring deliverance. And as we see in this passage, this deliverance that God brings, it isn't just for us, 
God's deliverance is for all people. It's not just for you and me. It's for everyone. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. And your young men shall see visions. Even on the male and female servants in those days, I will pour out my spirit. Here, Joel is looking ahead to the future from his perspective, and he's anticipating this time when God will show up and his spirit will act dramatically amongst his people. Of course, this is precisely what we find in the New Testament. We discover that Jesus, after his death and his resurrection, he spends 40 days revealing himself uh, to the crowds and raising up his disciples. And then he says this thing to him. He says, I'm going to leave you. He says, and I want you to go to, to Jerusalem, and I want you to wait. I want you to wait in Jerusalem, and then I'm going to send my spirit upon you. And so the early church, after Jesus ascended into heaven, they go and they wait in Jerusalem. And sure enough, guess what happens? The spirit comes upon them and, and begins to work in them. And here's what ends up happening. They end up praising God proclaiming the glory of God, proclaiming the glory of the gospel, but they end up proclaiming it in the languages of other people. They start proclaiming it in the languages of the nations. And what was interesting is that at that time, it was the day of Pentecost, which was one of the three major Jewish festivals. People had, had come from all around the Mediterranean world. People who spoke different languages were in Jerusalem, and they started to hear the gospel being proclaimed by these strange people in all these different languages. In fact, it was so weird and so strange to some people that they actually thought that the early church was drunk. And this is how Peter responds to this accusation in Acts chapter 2. But Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. For these people are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. And this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. And in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male servants and female servants, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heavens above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor and smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, this particular scene, as recorded in Acts chapter 2, where the Spirit comes upon the early church, this is a highly debated, highly controversial passage. In modern times, we just love to debate, well, okay, when, well, the way the Spirit worked in the early church, does it still work that way today? And, and how is it different? Is it different? And, and what does it look like when the Spirit works among us and, and all of this? And we get so caught up in this question about how the Spirit works that we miss the main point. That what was the reason the Spirit came? It was to reach out to the nations. It was to proclaim the gospel to those who didn't have hope. And this is why today is the day of Pentecost in the church calendar. And this is why for the past month we've had Missions Month and we've emphasized the importance of supporting those who are engaging in evangelism and missions here and around the world because this was started all on the day of Pentecost as recorded in Acts chapter 2. So, to summarize all of this, what do we see here? God's ultimate plan is to bring deliverance. It's deliverance for all people. Now, the question is this. What is our part? Or what must we do to ensure God's deliverance? And here's what emerges in Joel and then also emerges in Acts chapter 2 is this. In order to experience the deliverance of God, you have to turn to God. God is sovereign over all things, but He will not force Himself upon you. 
that to actually experience the deliverance of God requires that we turn to Him. Chapter 2, verses 12 through 13. Yet even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and with mourning, and rend your hearts and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and he relents over disaster. How do we experience the deliverance of God? By turning to God. Now, who is this for, right? Who should turn to God? I think it's really easy at this point to say, uh, well, I know who should turn to my God, uh, should turn to God. Uh, my mother-in-law needs to turn to God, and my next-door neighbor needs to turn to God, and my, my, my husband or my wife, they need to turn to God, right? It's really easy for us to see this as a message for everybody else. But here's what emerges in, in, in Joel, is that this is for everyone. No, but nobody's excused from this. Everybody needs to turn to God. We see this here in verses 15 through 16. It says, blow the trumpet in Zion, consecrate a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the people, consecrate the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children, even nursing infants. Let the bridegroom leave his room and the bride her chamber. What Joel here is, he's describing, it's a way of saying everybody needs to come. Everybody needs to turn. Everybody needs to turn to God. And, and he highlights uh, nursing infants. Uh, sorry, ladies, you need to come. You need to repent. I don't care. You got a baby. You got. You need to come. You need to repent. And 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 then and then it says the uh, the the bridegroom must leave his room. In in ancient Israel, a, a, a married couple, they were sort of excused from every activity. They were excused from work. They were excused from social obligations. It was a very community oriented way of living. Everything was done communally. They were they were excused from religious activities. For, for a year, they were able to just kind of be by themselves, right? So they're, normally, they're excluded from everything. And Joel's like, nope. No, nope, you need to come home early from your honeymoon. You need to repent. It's a way of saying there is nobody who has an excuse. Everyone needs to turn to God. Who needs to turn to God? Everyone. When do we need to, need to turn to God? Now. Notice this. Yet even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart. What we're going to discover time and time again with the prophets is this sense of urgency when it comes to returning to God. Don't, don't wait. Don't think about it. Don't mull it over. Don't, as a friend of mine told me back in high school, he said, yeah, I, I think I, I need, to, need to get this whole God thing figured out, but I want to make sure I get my career established first. Don't wait. Whatever excuses you might have in your mind, say that nothing. It's, it's now. Everyone should turn to God now. Who? Everyone. When? Now. And how? How do we turn to God? Wholeheartedly. Turn to God with everything that you have. Last week, we finished up a series on the Great Commandments. We saw what it looks like to love God, and it's love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. We find the same thing emerges here. We are called to turn wholeheartedly to God. Uh, verse 12 says this again, Yet even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and with mourning. This idea of fasting and weeping and mourning, all of that is just a symbolic way of saying, turn everything over to God. Psalm 139, verses 23 through 24, I think really sums up what this kind of looks like. It says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. You see, this is, this is a posture that says, look, I may not even know 
what ways I have turned from you. God, I need you to, to reveal that to me. I lay my life before, I lay my heart, my mind, I lay everything before you, and I ask you to reveal to me in what ways have I turned from you. This is a wholehearted turning to God. Now, what emerges from this is another very uncomfortable truth. And here's what it is. The hardships we face are often the consequence of our own sin. This is something we find again in the prophets, and it's, it's actually presupposed in Joel. It's presupposed, actually, that this whole locust plague that comes, that it is a result of the sin of the people of Israel, that the hardships that they are facing are the result of their own sin, a consequence for their sin. Now, listen. What we're not saying here is that there is necessarily a, quote, one-to-one -one correspondence between an act of sin and a hardship that comes into your life. We need to be careful to understand that. I'm, I'm not saying, for example, that uh, this past month, uh, a number of people in my household, they came down with the stomach bug. I didn't, uh, and the reason for that is because they're living in sin and I'm not. No, that, 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 that's, not, that's not what we're saying here. There's not a one-to-one -one correspondence between your particular act of sin and a hardship that comes into your life. But what the prophets want us to see is simply this. At, 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 just at the very at the basic level, what we need to remember and understand is that all hardship is the result of living in a fallen world. All pain and all suffering is ultimately the result of the fact that we as a people, humanity, have turned away from God. That's why there is pain and suffering in this world. And so hardships remind us of that breach in our relationship with God. So at the very least, when we experience hardship, it's designed to serve as a way to call us back to God to reflect on our own lives, and to recognize that every single one of us has, in some way, contributed to the fallenness of the world in which we live. Or as C.S. Lewis puts it, he says that pain is God's megaphone to rouse a deaf world. Elsewhere it says that God disciplines those he loves as a father of the son he delights in. That when these hardships come into our life, we can see them as a way in which God is, is seeking to draw us back to Him. What's interesting is that Joel actually never specifies what the sin of Israel was in this particular situation. Almost as if he wants them to individually reflect on ways in which they have turned away from God. And then the whole point is that when we confess our sin, when we turn back to God, we experience deliverance. Why is this? Why does confession lead to deliverance? Well, ultimately, the answer is because on the cross, Jesus died to absorb the consequences for our sin. Jesus died to take the judgment that we deserve. And we see this, actually, we see a hint of this in the book of Joel itself. In verse 31 of chapter 2, it says this, The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the great and awesome day of the Lord. Now, as we've already seen, this imagery of the, the sun darkening and whatnot, in Joel's original context, he, he had envisioned this locust plague that, that blocks out the light. But this imagery of the sun going, going dark, th this becomes uh, an image that is used throughout the prophetic literature, and it, without any necessarily it explaining why it's getting darkened, it just becomes an image for the day of the Lord. It becomes an image for the day when God will come in judgment and in justice. And of course, what's interesting is where do we find the sun going dark? We find it when Jesus is crucified. In Matthew chapter 27, verse 45, we read as Jesus is hanging on the cross, it says this, 
Now from the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lemma sabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Friends, the heart of the Christian faith is that in the person of Jesus Christ, God has taken upon himself, ultimately he has taken the consequences that we deserve. That when we put our faith in him, when we trust in him, we know we can have ultimate deliverance because Jesus has taken it upon himself. We now come to our time of communion. What is communion all about? Communion is an opportunity to turn to God. In verse 13 of chapter 2, it says, Rend your hearts and not your garments. Here what Joel is getting at is this idea that genuine repentance is not a religious act. To rend your garments, they would tear their, their clothes as a religious act of repentance. And what Joel wants them to see is, listen, that religious act, that's not, that's not true repentance. Repentance is a matter of the heart. Yet at the same time, Joel isn't saying there isn't a place for a religious dimension to your repentance. Just a few verses later, he says this, Between the vestibule and the altar, let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep. Between the vestibule and the altar, he's saying there, there, there is a place for a religious act of repentance. And the point is that religion, rightly understood, can be a way to help your heart turn to God. Through the symbolic expression of repentance, it can actually be a way that helps your heart turn to the Lord. This is why we take communion. You do not need to eat bread and grape juice to repent. It's not required to be right with God that you take communion. But rather, in taking the bread and the cup, which represent the body and the blood of Christ, it's there to point us to the reality of what God has done such that our heart repentance is more genuine. 